All right, the, the slide which we're still on uh, is this one here. And the question at the bottom is now about efficiency. This is correct, but it's not efficient. It says there's a way that a real compiler will reduce this loop from six instructions to four instructions and speed it up by 50%. It says six to three. Uh, or maybe that's possible. But first, let's just work on uh, six to four. Uh, do you notice that the uh, test is done in the middle and the bottom has a jump? That means this loop has a branch and a jump. And I'd like to suggest to you that it's very possible to write loops that only have a branch. How about this? Top of loop. Blah, 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 blah. Branch, equal or not equal or whatever. Top. Blah, blah, blah. How's that work? You do this, 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 and now you test with one branch instruction. If you want to go back, you branched back to top. If you want to go out of the loop, you just keep going on. So the loop consists of this. It's called a bottom tested loop. How many jumps does it contain? How many jumps? No, it has no jumps. How many branches does it contain? One. How many jumps does this contain? How many branches does it contain? Yeah, it has two for flow control. This has one for flow control. So obviously, that's going to get rid of an instruction by having a bottom tested loop. OK, what's the objection to a bottom tested loop? What's the objection to a bottom tested loop? It forces you to execute all the instructions at least once. Does this force you to execute all the instructions at least once? No, it doesn't. You can come to the first time the branch, and you can say, they're not equal, I'm out of here, and never do this instruction. Is there a possibility here of never doing some? No, there isn't. What if you need that? You know, this says, en as and sifir carry. This says, en as and carry. Can we modify this to make it en as and sifir carry? Sure. How would we do that? Right here at the top, we jump to test. Okay, so what's been done now? Before we come into the loop, we go to right here. And so now, the first thing we do is hit the test. Uh, and if we don't pass it, we're out with cipher carry. Everybody understand? You can turn a bottom tested loop into behaving like a top tested loop. I want to ask you, how many times in the body of the loop do I have a jump? Zero. In the body of the loop. See, we jumped the top. There's the loop. How many times is there a jump in there? Zero. Good. If I do this loop 10 million times, how many branches will I execute? 10 million. How many jumps will I execute? Zero in the body and one outside the body. If I do this loop 10 million times, how many jumps will I execute? 10 million. How many branches will I execute? 10 million. 20 million. So basically, half the, we dropped an instruction out of the body of the loop. Whatever else you have to do, you have to do. Okay? But you can enter a loop at a point which is not the top of the loop. So we've entered at the bottom to give it the option of en azendan sifir carry. If you don't need that, take it out, and now it's en azendan bir carry. Okay? Is that clear to everybody? Bottom tested loops get rid of the jump instruction. Bottom tested loops get rid of the jump instruction. Say it with me, everybody. Bottom tested loops get rid of the jump instruction. Say it again. Bottom tested loops get rid of the jump instruction. Therefore, they're more efficient. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. If your code runs 50% slower than your competition's code, why should I buy your code? Hmm. I don't think it is cheaper because I'll be done and can use my computing resources for other things if I use the competition's code. So it's going to actually cost me less in the long run. Your code ties up my computing resources, and I can't do other work as long as your code is running. No, sir. No, sir. Slow code. Nobody likes it in this world. Okay. Now, I talked about executing a loop a million times. There's some loops that execute a lot more than that. Big three-dimensional arrays with nested loops. The inner loop runs many, many, many times. Okay, just think about modeling planet Earth's 
you know, uh, climate, for all this climate wars and climate discussion. Think about dividing the atmosphere up into, you know, three-dimensional cubic sections and how many there would be, or oceanographic movements, or anything like that. Migration of polar bears or, or geese, for Pete's sakes, takes enormous computing power. So you're modeling anything big. How about let's go over to the physics department and the nanotechnology area. You think they run big computer models with lots of variables that take long computation? Sure they do. What about Levent Gorel breaking the world record for electromagnetic calculations? Anybody have any idea how long his programs run? Days. They get empty time on supercomputers when they're, everybody's on vacation and they reserve a few days of computing time. Yeah, there's a lot of big problems. And so speeding up your code, whether it's a big or medium or little problem, makes a difference. Oh, never mind. My code's going to run on an embedded processor in a car. All we're going to do is just calculate when the airbag needs to blow up or, or how the brakes are going to control for anti-skid. Do you think it matters how fast you calculate? I guess so. Human life's at stake. You shouldn't be slow, should you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, never mind. My code's going to run on, you know, the next rocket that launches the next Turksat into, into space. Does it matter if my code is fast or slow? Yeah, it does. Things, bad things happen when rockets are launching satellites before they get into orbit. Man, that's no time to mess up. That's no time to have, you know, so the point is slow code just eats up computing resources that could be used for something else. So yeah, let's make our code as efficient as possible. How do you make your high-level code as efficient as possible? Was there? How do you make your high-level code as efficient as possible? So it runs as fast as possible? No idea? I guess you're going to write slow code then. OK, if you have no idea how to make it faster, if you're farking to be the data centers, well, it's going to be slow. How would you make your code run faster? A more logical way to execute. I think your, your CS101, 102, 201, and 202 teacher would be disappointed if that's the best answer. A more logical way to execute. Hello? Anybody heard of big O notation? Find a better algorithm which has lower big O you know, limiting value. That's one way. So your algorithm runs faster. What's another way? Speed up your code. Does the language you choose make any difference? Does the compiler you choose make any difference? Okay, then tell me about those differences. What's your name? Yeah. Arif. Arif, tell me about the difference a language can make. If we choose Java or we choose C, what difference do we get there? Why is C faster? C is in a category of languages called compiled languages. Java is in a category of languages called interpreted languages. Anybody have an idea between compiled and interpreted? Interpreted means the translation to low level is happening real time. Fetch one, translate it. Fetch one, translate it. What does compiled mean? It's happened in advance. Okay, so compiling is in advance. Interpreting is dynamic real time. Okay, if you have time in advance, you can optimize. Nobody even sells a non-optimizing compiler anymore. What do optimizing compilers do? Hello? They do things like squeeze out assembly language instructions, especially in critical places like inner loops, in order to make them run excellently fast. Do you think that, that interpreters that run at real time have the same luxury to be able to do that same level of optimization? They do not. Also, optimization requires a big look at large sections of code in order to see where things could be optimized. Interpretation doesn't do that. Interpretation looks at a very small window of code. Can it give the same results? Obviously not. So some languages are slower. Now you know why, Arif. Why is C faster than Java? C is a compiled language. And compilers have an advantage. They get offline, in advance, optimization opportunities that interpreted languages don't get. That's the first thing. OK, now, we've talked about algorithm. What was that called? A more logical way to write the program. We've talked about language. Now let's talk about compiler. I pick C. Microsoft wants to sell me a compiler. Vendor A, vendor B, vendor C, they all want to sell me compilers. Does it matter which compiler I buy? This one costs 10,000, this one costs 3,000, this one's free, it's open source on the internet. This one somebody gave me, it's not even licensed, but here's a compiler. What does it matter about which compiler I pick? I'm not talking about ethics and Yasal and you know, intellectual property, I'm talking about performance. What does it matter which com compiler I take? What's your name, sir? Hmm, or Oitun. Oitun. What, what does it matter if I choose this compiler or that compiler or that compiler? 
You know, why, why should I matter? Take the free one. Take the unlicensed one your friend gave you for Pete's sake. So, you know, if it doesn't matter, why pay $10,000 for the commercial one? <coughs> hardware. Compiler, hardware. I thought a compiler was a program. A compiler is a piece of software, I thought. Use of desktop laptop. I mean, no, I'm assuming that you have a computer and this vendor says, my compiler will run on your computer and compile your C programs. And another vendor says, my compiler will run on your platform also and compile your C programs. And it costs less. I thought we were talking about performance here. I'm, I'm still working on performance. Okay, what do you think? Why get a compiler A when B and C are also available and they cost less money or they cost more money? Why, why get A? More efficiently, in, for example. Uh huh. Actually, we've we've already got um, a claims here of four different ways. That way takes six instructions. This way takes five instructions. This way takes four instructions, and this way takes three instructions. So there's four different claims here. They're not all shown. There's the big slow one. I've showed you how to eliminate uh, the bottom. By changing the bottom test, we get down to five. If we do something else, we get down to four. There's a claim you can get down to three. So what he said, more efficiency, is what I was saying about optimization. So this compiler does OK. This one really optimizes. This one doesn't do very well at all. This is the one that's going to give me the best performance because it gives the smallest number of assembly and therefore machine language instructions. Do you understand that all of them start with this? But they end up with different amounts of this. So what causes the speed in the machine? How many times I run the loop, which is big O notation, and how many instructions in the loop, which is the compiler and the optimizations thereof? Okay. Are we clear? It's not all about big O. They talk about algorithm efficiency. Yes, it's important. You can't save a bad algorithm with great compiling and fast hardware. But you can wreck a great algorithm with poor compiling and slow hardware and wrong language choices. Okay? So the performance game begins to take on a bigger thing. You don't just pull out your wallet and buy a bigger memory or say, I need a faster processor. There's some other factors involved in performance, aren't they? And what happens when the boss says, I'm tired of pulling out my wallet. You're always spending my money on hardware upgrades. How about you write a little bit better software and make the performance of your algorithms and your code run faster on the expensive hardware that you've already made me buy? Gulp, that's not a nice day, is it, on your career? You know, boss, we just need to spend some more of your money. He says, no, we need to spend some more of your time and brain power. Is there not enough there? I'll find somebody else who can do it. OK. <laughs> Right, now, now we're right at the place that our book calls the hardware-software interface. We're right at the place where performance happens or is lost. And it's related, as you can see, to low-level language statements. I think everybody knows that every one of these has to be fetched, decoded, operands found, executed, and results stored. And that one the same, that one the same, that one the same, that one the same. Right? This is never fetched. This is just compiled or interpreted into this. And this is actually fetched on the hardware. And if you compile, you did this before the thing even turned the power on. If you interpret, then you do this while the power's on and this while the power's on. Tamama. Okay? You're running a program which says this is the input and execution is the output. In a compiler, you're running a program which this is the input and this is the output. Okay? All right, let's go on. Basic block. A basic block is a sequence of instructions which has no embedded branches except at the end. We don't put branches here. Branches are at the end and you can branch out. And no branch targets to come in in the middle, only at the beginning. Okay? So you can enter here or you can re-enter here. And you can leave here or you can leave here and re-enter. Got it? So it's a basic block. That's the definition. And a compiler identifies things called basic blocks and they're so, so important in optimization. A compiler has to first figure out what the basic blocks are, and then optimize those basic blocks. An advanced processor can execute uh, basic blocks in an accelerated or faster way. That's about all I'm going to say on optimizing compilers for now. We're going to come back to the topic later. But I want to encourage you to take the course called Compiler 
theory or compiler building or introduction to compilers or whatever we offer. It's an elective course. It'll take you deep into the mechanics of how performance happens or doesn't happen because it's about translation from a range of high-level languages to a range of low-level languages. And then the issues of semantics and meaning and syntax translation and handling the, the, the trying to make the code that results be fast code. So that course is offered, I think, once every two years. Maybe it's offered once per year. When you start looking at your elective courses, remember William Hoja recommended the compiler course as a way to get deeper into understanding the relation between software and hardware. Okay? All right. Um, we've got these two conditional branches. B, E, and E means branch if these two are not equal. B, E, Q means branch if they're equal. This is where you go if you take the branch. If you don't take it, you just continue with the next instruction. OK, so here's an example. If I equals J. It's an if, so therefore we actually test the opposite here. This is equality, we test inequality. There's i and j. If they're not equal, go to L1. If they're equal, do the addition. In other words, if you failed this, it means you're going to come here and add. So there we go, and then we, in either case, go on. The i format looks like this, opcode, which in this case the b n e opcode is 05. 16 and 17 are the codes for uh, S0 and S1. 16-bit offset is going to be somehow related to the destination. 16 bits isn't really a full address. 32 bits is a full address. So somehow we're going to have to translate that into our address to go to if we take the branch. Obviously, if we don't take the branch, then we just go here. But if we take the branch, we've got to have the address of this, that L1 address. OK. So the question is, how do you specify the branch destination? Now, pay close attention here. It gets tricky again. Um, just like in load word and store word, we can use an address which is based in a register as part of the address and then add an amount to that. Remember that discussion that we had uh, here for quite a long time about what's the purpose of this and what's the purpose of this? And we saw that. We add the two together. This is a 16-bit quantity, isn't it? And this is a 32-bit quantity stored in a register. But this is only a space in an instruction in the least significant half. So it's only 16 bits. But you can take this and add that to it and form a 32-bit address. You would simply take this and extend it to make 32 bits and then add the two together. We could do the same idea here. We're going to add our 16-bit offset to a register. Which register is the question. And the best register is the one that says the address of the current instruction is right here. And I'm going to allow you, with your 16-bit offset, to put in a negative number and go back. That's good for loops. Or put in a positive number and go forward. That's good for loops or for if-elses and cases and things like that. So therefore, this 16-bit offset is added to the program counter register. Okay? Its use is automatically implied by the instruction. If you have a BNE or BEQ, it says, take this and add it to the PC to form the target address. Take this offset and add it to the PC to form the target address. And the PC automatically gets updated to PC plus 4 during the fetch cycle. Obviously, when I fetch an instruction, the assumption is I'm going to go to the next one after this. So what we do is we actually don't add 16 bits to that. We add the 16 bits to that, OK, because we already have it. We've changed our PC value early in the instruction cycle. So that means that what we're able to do is go negative half the distance and positive half the distance from where we are now. Or as I said, you can branch back. How far? 2 to the 16th? If you say yes, then I can't go forward at all. So what we're going to do is split it and allow negative numbers from 0 down to that and positive numbers from 0 up to that. And you can see that takes 16 bits. 2 to the 16th divided by 2 is 2 to the 15th in the negative direction and 2 to the 15th in the positive direction. So that allows me to branch both directions, both ways. Pretty big branching, too. 2 to the 15th is 32,000 bytes. It's pretty far. And then we're going to actually make it 32,000 words by assuming a double zero here on the end. In other words, if it's always double zero, we don't need to write it. So in fact, my 16 bits is this, and I'm going to append on two extra zeros. So the 16 bits allows me to go positive 2 to the 15th power words, or negative 2 to the 15th power words, which is 2 to the 17th power bytes positive, or 2 to the 17th power bytes negative. Why do I always add zero, zero? because my instructions always begin on an address whose least two significant bits is chif cipher. Right? I'm not going to start an instruction at address 3 and have it be in 3, 4, 5, and 6. 
They're going to be starting at 0, or at 4, or at 8, or at C, or at 10, or at 14, or at 18, or at 1C, or at 20. Got it? So instructions are aligned on boundaries. We call those word boundaries. Even though every byte has an individual address, a group of four bytes is a word. We're not going to let a word just be anywhere. If it's an instruction, it's going to be aligned to the ones that start on 00. So you can see what happens. The offset, 16-bit field, gets sign extended. So if it's negative, we fill with negative, positive, fill, and stick two zeros on the end. That gets added to the value of your PC plus 4. That's the update on the PC. Those two quantities are added to form a 32-bit number. That's your branch destination address. You either go there or you go to this, PC plus 4. You're either going to go to the next instruction or you're going to go to that instruction. So we have two choices, and the branch will determine which one we take. Any questions about this? We form two alternative addresses. Everybody got it? So after address PC, my choice is I either go to PC plus 4 or I go to PC plus 4 plus. PC plus 4 plus what? Sign extended immediate value times 4 to put the shift cipher on the end times 4. I shifted it over. Right? So either I just go to the next one or I calculate the next one, and then I branch forward or backward, negative or positive, this amount with a two zeros on the end. Okay, that's my, that's my address calculation. I can do that in hardware. It's not very hard. Okay, now, with BEQ and BNE, which tell me take the test if you match the condition or take the branch if you don't match the condition, uh, we can branch on equality and inequality. But what about the other branches? What about branch less than, okay? Branch greater than, branch greater than or equal, branch less than or equal. As you know, there's six inequality tests that can be done uh, with two values. And so what we're going to do is not create four more new instructions. We're going to create one more new instruction and use it in combination with the B and E and BEQ to form the inequality branches. Huh. Using combination. That means you're going to use two instructions together, right, Hoja? Yeah. Two assembly language instructions to make inequality branches. Yeah, Hoja, won't that be slow? And the answer is, it will be. But our design principle is make the common case fast. What's the common case? Equality and inequality branching. Think about loops you've written. When x is you know, equal to phalange or you know, not equal to phalange, if this or else this, we test usually on equality and inequality. I'm sorry, on equality and, and non-equality. So therefore, uh, the common case can be done in one instruction. The uncommon cases can be done in two. Well, why not make them all done in one instruction, Hoja? And the answer is adding the complexity to test inequalities of greater than, greater than or equal, less than, less than or equal into the single instruction slows down the two that we already have. So if you want to keep these fast, don't try to pack in the features of greater than, greater than or equal, less than or less than or equal. Instead, have a separate instruction. So that's what we're going to do. We've, we've made a choice here in architectural design to keep the common case fast and let the uncommon cases be slow. So look at how this set less than works. Here are two registers. And if this one is less than this one in value, we set this. If this one is not less than this one, we clear this. So let's read it. If S0 is less than S1, then set T0 to 1, else clear T0 to 0. Very simple instruction, set less than. It has an immediate version with an I here. And of course, you take out that and you put in a number, right? Just like all the immediates. You don't get two registers to compare. You get one register and one number. Anyway, look at the SLT. It's an R format instruction, so that means it's got a zero here, and the code for SLT is found down here in the function field. It takes three registers. The RS and RT are these two here. The destination is the first one here, but third one here. And it's going to either leave the value of zero or one in this, in this uh, field when we're done. Alternate versions of SLT include SLT I with an immediate instead of a second register, SLT unsigned, which it, we compare these two with an unsigned instead of a signed comparison, and SLTIU, where the second one is immediate and the comparison is unsigned. All right, now unsigned and signed comparison need a little bit more explanation. Let's have a look here. Here's a value. Can everybody look at that and see that it's all ones? If S0 is a signed number, what's the meaning of that? Negative 1. If S0 is an unsigned number, what's the meaning of that? 
2 to the 32nd power Chikar 1, right? It's either a very, very, very large positive integer or it's negative 1. Depends upon if you interpret it as a signed or an unsigned number. Let's look at this one. What's the value of that? Does it make any difference if I interpret this as a signed or an unsigned number? It doesn't matter. It's positive 1 in either case. Or 1 if it's unsigned, positive 1 if it's signed. Great. Now let's ask the question. If I do SLT on these and I do SLTU on those, do I get a different result? Yeah. S0, is it less than S1 when I consider it a signed number? Yeah. That's negative 1. That's positive 1. It's less. So in that case, I set t0 to 1. Let's try it again when it's an unsigned number. This is 2 to the 32nd minus 1. This is 1. Is this less than that? No. So t0 gets set to be a 0 if it's an unsigned understanding of the numbers. Do we understand the difference between signed and unsigned? OK. When would we be using unsigned comparisons? The answer is address calculations. Address calculations don't have any negative numbers. There's no such thing as a negative address. So if addresses are always 0 or positive, then address calculations would think this way. But lots and lots of numbers in the real world can be positive or negative, so you've got to remember which one you're using. When you're doing address calculations, that's the safer one to go with. OK. Now, we can use set less than, BEQ, and BNE, and the fixed value of 0 in combinations to create other conditions. Let's name the other conditions. Branch less than, branch less than or equal, branch greater than, branch greater than or equal. Okay? If we had a branch less than uh, instruction, it would look like this. And we'd say, if this is less than that, then go to that label, else continue. But we don't have such an instruction. We could add it to the architecture, which I said would slow it down, and that's not a very wise choice. Or we can create this function out of two existing instructions. And the clue is given here as to how to do that. And the same with this, and the same with this, and the same with this. I think it's going to be given. Yes, it is. How would you do branch if less than when you didn't have a branch if less than? You only had SLT, BEQ, and BNE. Well, here's the answer. AT is an assembler temporary register. Could be any register. And we're going to set it to be 1 if this is less than that. Notice I want to ask, is this less than that? So I'm asking the question here, and I'm setting this to be 1 if it's true. Now I want to take the branch. If it's, this is less than that, I want to go to label. So I set this to be true, if, if, if it is less. And then what am I comparing? Inequality of this and this. All right, now this only has two possible values. What are the two possible values from this? Yaw 0, yaw 1. If they're not equal, what does it mean? It's 1. Which means it was less, which means I should go to label. It says branch if they're not equal to label. Bingo. It does the same thing. Any questions about that? All right, the second homework is going to be in the same way, figure out what you have to do to do BLE, BGT, and BGE on your own or at Mozart or at home tonight or in your dorm room or whatever. Okay? So those are little bitty thinking assignments to show that you can take this principle and do something with it. Don't be surprised if the next quiz asks you to show how to implement BGE in real MIPS assembly language instructions. Don't be surprised at all. I've told you. Get ready. Uh, what else can I do? I can't, I can't come to your house and look over your shoulder and say, come on, do it. I told you to do it. It's up to you. Are you mature? Are you willing to put in some work? You want to learn anything from this course? If your answer to those questions is, no, I'm not mature, no, I'm not willing to put in any work, and no, I don't want to learn anything in this course, don't have a big hope about passing the course. Okay? But I want to pass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the two are related. Okay? If you want to pass the course, show maturity, uh, put in time, and, and be willing to uh, learn something in this course. I've given you an interesting opportunity here to learn this. I know that watching it doesn't really do it. You need to actually roll up your sleeves and get your hands in it. This is some intellectual effort here to think about how do I use this temporary? Does everybody notice that whatever you uh, used here, you use it again here against the zero register? Uh -huh. So now the choices become, as you can guess, um, do I use BNE or BEQ here? And what order do I test these in? And basically, two choices there and two choices there gives me four options. Hello? Four things. OK, so that's the big clue. You can do it kind of like a call-up like that if you just play with the, the four choices. Any questions? Yeah? In the first 
first statement, uh, can we set z uh, zero, one? First statement meaning that, or that, or that? Which one's first? This first statement in blue, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I am, uh, instead of assign the temporary, uh, temporary register, uh -huh. can we use zero? Use the zero register. No, because the zero register can't have anything ever written into it. It's a permanently hardwired set of zeros, which you can use as a source and a constant anytime you like, but nothing can be written into the zero register. So, sorry, it won't work. It has to stay zero. And what you want to do here is maybe make it one and maybe make it zero. No, we can't, we can't do that. It's fixed at zero. You could use any register here and here. The reason the assembler temporary register is given is because these instructions are called pseudo instructions. A pseudo instruction means the assembler allows you to use it, but it doesn't really exist in the machine. So the assembler has to translate it into things that really do exist in the machine, like these. Okay? And when you give this, the assembler says, okay, I know how to open that up into the two, but I need a place to temporarily transfer a value from here to here. If I choose T0, maybe there's valuable things in T0 right now at this point in the code. If I choose S5, maybe there's something very critical in S5. Which register can I choose? The assembler doesn't know what values you have in your registers and therefore needs to have what? A little private place that he can write things for himself or herself and then read them back later. So the assembler temporary is a reserved register that you're not supposed to program with because the assembler has already agreed it's not going to program with your registers, so please don't program with its registers. Aha! Uh -huh. So this is needed for the assembler when it does things like take pseudo instructions and open them up into real. It needs a little place for its own work. And the compiler, I'm sorry, the operating system also needs that. That's the purpose of the K0 and K1 registers, which are registers 25 and 26, I think. We looked at those the other day. Okay, so there are some reserved registers, and if you use them, you're going to find bad things happening uh, <laughs> to your code. Because if you had a very important value in AT right here, you're going to find that it's going to end up with a 0 or 1 after this instruction. And you're going to say, what happened to my very important value? Well, the assembler thought it was free to use the AT register because that's the convention. But I think that you can obey that as long as you can trust the assembler is not going to suddenly be changing values in your registers. Okay? So that's the idea of reserving registers. So the AT is a good choice here for the assembler to be able to use. Okay, now such branches like these are included in the instruction set as pseudo instructions. They're recognized and expanded by the assembler. They're not really real, and, and of course they're the reason that the assembler needs to have a reserve register. If we were to include them in the MIPS ISA and have hardware for these, it would definitely be slower than this kind of hardware. And by having slower hardware and then putting it, you'll slow down the cycle time of a single instruction. Um, it does more work per instruction, therefore it would require a slower clock, and then all instructions would be paralyzed, penalized. If you make the clock slower, the whole machine, every instruction slowed down. And all, all of us will say, Sirf senin yuzinden yabashladik ya, yapma. Okay, so our choice is to slow every instruction down or to have this be 2 and this be 2 and this be 2 and this be 2. And I think you can see that that's a much better choice. Okay? You know, make the common case fast, make the uncommon case slow. That's what's been done here. It's a good compromise. So these are the common case. We made them fast. And in the case of the others, we made a good design compromise, principle 3 and principle 4. Now, bounds check shortcut. Everybody knows that when um, indexes are used in structured data, there are boundaries. The index can't be a negative number, and it shouldn't be larger than the size of the structure. So when you use an index, it should be checked. If you don't check it, you know what's going to happen? Watch this. This is this simple, simple example. If you have an index, like, I don't know, what do we have before? Remember there was an array called save, so bye, okay? So here we go, here's the array, and here's save zero, and we want to go to save, so bye. Let's say that the array, array has a maximum of 100 elements, okay? Tell me what happens if you accidentally reference location 204. What's going to happen? You're going to take the base address, and you're going to add 816 bytes to it, and you're going to end up with 
going somewhere in memory, way past the end of your array, to down here, and you're going to get that and think that it belonged to save, but it doesn't. It's some garbage, and you're going to use it, and you're going to see your program crash and burn in lovely flames, multicolored flames. <laughs> it's going to be great. It'll be great unless it happens to be a jet fighter or a tank or a road control system or an automatic braking system or a satellite. It, it won't be great then. It'll be really sad and expensive and maybe people will die. Huh. Code is serious business. People's lives, people's money depend upon it. Think if that was a banking error. Well, maybe somebody's account lost a little bit of money or maybe the Turkish treasury just went broke because of what you did. Okay? Think if it was a, you know, a, a decision control error, error in battle strategy or company strategy or government you know, foreign policy strategy. Computers support a lot of things these days, a lot of real important things. Think if you did that, you went out of bounds and drew some garbage data, thought it was the real thing and went ahead with your calculations. No telling what might happen, but it won't be good. I promise you it won't be good. So bounds checking is a very important thing to do, isn't it? Now, you all know the difference between C and Java on that point? What's the, what does Java do? What does C do on bounds checking? Huh? Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, and throws an exception if you're out of bounds. And Java checks the bounds. You don't have to write any code to check your own bounds, do you? C crashes. Why does Java check the bounds? Because if it didn't, Java would crash too. Java was a later language. It learned that programmers don't generally remember to check their bounds, and so it does automatic bounds checking. Right. So what does that mean? Therefore, when you reference something in a Java structured data, when that's translated, what's it going to do? It's going to put in bounds checking code before it actually does the access and throw the exception if it gets out of bounds. What does out of bounds mean? Was there? What does out of bounds mean? Is this out of bounds? Is this out of bounds? Is this out of bounds? Yeah, so out of bounds means lower than the minimum or higher than the maximum. Great. Those are physical memory addresses. Let's ask this. Is that out of bounds? Save of negative 2? Yeah. How about this one? How about save 100? Is that out of bounds? Nope. Just in. Oh, wait a minute. We said 100 elements. Ah, if there's 100 elements, the last one's 99, the first one's 0. That's out of bounds, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of tricky there, isn't it? So we have to know what the bounds are. The index can have bounds tested, or the memory physical addresses can have the bounds tested. But the problem with testing the memory physical addresses is structures can be relocated. You don't really know what they are. So it's better to test the index. All right, now let's go to the slide here. Treating signed numbers as if they were unsigned gives us a low-cost way of checking bounds. Look, does that look like a nice index bounds test? It shouldn't be lower than 0. It's got to be equal or greater. Shouldn't be equal to y. That's going to be 1 greater than my max. So that's a nice bounds test. Tell me, how many instructions do you expect that would take? Looks like you're going to have to test that. And then you'll have to test that, right? Two tests, looks like. Is it this? If it's OK, then do the second test. And if that's OK, go on. If we fail either test, we're out. Looks like two separate tests, doesn't it? Check that, check that. So that would be so much code. And every time you access an array, which is very common inside loops, you'd be doing those two tests, those two tests, those two tests. You know what? Optimizing compilers are a lot smarter than that. They say, let's do it with one test. Right? Now watch the one test. SLTU followed by BEQ. How many tests is that? That's one, it's one test. We, we go to out of bounds if we fail this test. How did we do it with one test? We used signed numbers as if they were unsigned numbers. Which test are we doing here? Unsigned, OK. Let's see how it works. If I do this test, I'm testing S1 and S2, and obviously the S1 and T2. Uh, the S1, I believe, is this. Does that make sense? Yeah. If S1 is greater than T2, um, we're, we're, it means that, and T2 is the maximum, what does that mean? What does that mean? Out of bounds, right? OK. What about if S1 is less than 0? Also means out of bounds. Can we combine those two tests together into one? This slide is saying yes, we can. I think I'll stop talking and let you look at it and figure it out.
Okay, everybody pay attention. Stop sleeping. Have a look at it. See how we do it with one test. Raise your hand if you understand the principle now and you don't need any further explanation. Raise your hand. Okay, I guess that didn't do any good. <laughs> All right, let's, good, thank you. I see one hand, great. You get an A already. You don't have to come to any more classes. I'll just give you your A. You're off from the final exam. Okay, uh, no, you have a question actually? Or you do understand it. Okay, great, that's good. I'm gonna explain it anyway. Okay, so anyway. All right, let's, let's ask the question. If S1 is greater than, than T2, Yanni, if this is greater than this, are we out of bounds? Should we throw an exception? Yeah. If this is a negative number, should we throw an exception? Yeah, okay. Now, watch this. If this is a negative number, that means it begins with 1, and if we do an unsigned comparison, we think it's this kojeman buk positive number, don't we? I just showed that. Okay. What if it's not kojeman buk positive number, but it just happens to be bigger than this? Yeah. In either case, we want to go out of bounds. So if this is negative, or if this is bigger than this, it's going to look bigger than it in either case, because I'm using unsigned comparison. So with Birtash, I'm killing two birds at the same time. Got it? Okay. So now look what happens. Let's, if this is a negative number, or if it's bigger than T2, what happens here? Zero. Because it says set less than. So what is it, if this is less than that, and it's not a negative number, that's what I want. That means it's inbounds, and I set this to be 1, comes down to here, and if that 1 is different than 0, I don't branch to index out of bounds. Let's go the other way. If this is bigger than that, then this is going to set that. If this is negative, it looks like a kojeman buk negative number. It's going to look bigger than that. It's going to set that. If we set that to be, no, sorry, sorry, wrong, less than. If it looks bigger, then we won't set it, which means it's a zero. Zero comes down to here. Those are equal. We go to index out of bounds testing. Raise your hand if you understand it now. Two tests with one test using the unsigned version of the test. Just a trick. It's a speed up trick, but obviously it saves two lines of code in every indexing, and indexes are used all the time in accessing data structures. You, you took a whole course in abstract data types. You know that most of the time you have to find which member of the data type you're referencing. All right, uh, we've got a little bit of time left. Let's go into procedure calls. Okay, procedure calls. What's a procedure and what's a call? We can't talk about it unless you have some idea, some definitional Understanding. What's your name? Aishanur. I thought so. Aishanur. Um, if you're awake enough, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you ready? All right. What's a procedure and what's a procedure call? It's okay to not know the answer. All right, fine. Do you have any idea? What's a procedure? What's a procedure call? It's not written there. It assumes you know. Okay, what's a method and what's a method invocation? Everybody's supposed to know the answer to that. What's a method? Okan? Yeah. What's a method? A method is a way of doing a problem. It's okay, it's not the answer I'm looking for. Somebody try a little bit more. Not what a method does, but what a method is. What's a method? Yeah. Uh, some instructions uh, that are uh, reusable uh, again and again. Yeah, can be invoked again and again. In Java, the term is invoke which means go do it. And the thing that you invoke is called a method in Java. Am I right? Invoke a method. Go do that thing. Okay, that set of code. And be able to do it again and again and again. It's a block of code that does, as, as Okan was saying, a function or a thing. And you can invoke it over and over. All right, now, take out the word method and put in the word procedure. Take out the word invoke and put in the word call. And we're all ready to go. Got it? You call procedures, you invoke methods. Pecky, fark neither hoja, only the language. In some languages they're called procedures, or functions, or methods. And some languages call it invoking it, some call it calling it, some calling it running it. I don't know, they have different words. Okay, are we okay now on the definitions? Invoke a method is call a procedure. Same thing. Just, we took the Java, you know, definitions out and put in. Okay, so that means that we're going to cause to run a set of code, which when it finishes will 
automatically allow us to continue from the place that we called it, invoked it, ran it, whatever. Okay? So I think everybody needs to know this basic idea. I'm running along in my code, and I find that I need to do something method C. So I go to and do method C, and when I'm done, I come back and I continue my code. Is that what happens when you invoke a method? Yeah. You, you, it's somewhere else, and you go do it, and then you come back, right? So if it says here, integrate, somewhere else, you tell me how to perform numerical integration. You don't actually write the integration code here. You just assume that I'm integrating a couple of things. It does it, comes back, and the value can now be assigned, can't it? You invoke a method, which means you gave it some parameters as its inputs. It did something with those. It gave a result. That result came back, and now you can assign or do something with that result, right? So you give it its inputs. It runs. It gives you a return result. That's what we're talking about, that kind of thing. And you see that there's a two transfers of control. Da 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 da. Go over here. Da 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 da. Go back over here. You see that? Did you know that? Yeah, I think all of us in our gut felt like I didn't have to write this other code, or I called it from a library, or my friend wrote it, or maybe I wrote it, but it's somewhere else in the program. It goes there, does that, comes back. We all had that sense, didn't we? There's two transfers of control. Go into the method when it's invoked, come back from the method when it's finished. Go into the procedure when it's called, return from the procedure when it's finished. So we're going to call this the call, and we're going to call this the return. Got it? So that arrow is that way, that arrow is that way. Here's the block of code that's the method or the procedure in high-level language. Now we're going to translate down to low-level language. Right, let's have a look in one minute. We need to have an instruction that says, go to it, but leave a way to get back. And that instruction is jump and link. Before we had a jump, which just said, go somewhere else. Remember, we jumped back from the bottom of a loop. We had J and J to top. This is J, but with and link, A-L. Tell me, when I come to the line here that says, go invoke the method or call the procedure, where do I want to come back and resume my code from when the procedure's finished? The next line. Yeah, exactly. This says go do, in fact, here, it's literally right here. Get that and now do the assignment, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So I know where I want to return to. It's very close to the place that I invoked it. But it's very close, not the same place. Look what happens if I return to the same place. Uh-oh. Return, do it, come back, do it. You know, I got to get a little bit past the invocation. If I come back to the exact place where I invoke it, I'm stuck in a permanent loop. So I want to come back just past the place where you invoke the method, Yanni, call the procedure. That's called a link. Since we, when we called it, we know where we want to return to, then this return is the linking. So this is the J part, this is the AL part. Together, jump and link back when you're finished. So we have the return address as the address of the next thing we want to do when we do the jump. Got it? So we know where we're jumping to, and we know where we're returning to. The two transfers of control are known in advance at the time you come to make the call of the procedure, the invocation of the method. Come on. So what does it mean? It means it saves PC plus 4, Yanni, the next instruction's address, in subspecial register so that when we get to the end here, it can say, I'm supposed to jump back to that place. Okay, And that's called JR. So we go to them with a JAL, and we return with a JR. Jump return. Jump and link, jump return. You see these are two transfers of control. They're not conditional, so they're not branches with B. They're jumps with a J. OK, my friends, we're deep into the technical stuff. It will not be helpful if I have to spend lots and lots of time on every slide. Uh, please read the book. Please work ahead. Please wrestle. Please come with some questions. Please be active learners, proactive. Come prepared for the next class. Come on. Good. See you then. Have a nice weekend.